Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, installment of Ask the Experts. Today, we're going to talk to the Visual Studio team about anything and everything that has to do with Visual Studio. And as always, when it comes to these Ask the Expert sessions, it's about what you want to know. We want to hear from you. We want you to ask the questions. Let's look at the slide here to see how we can engage. So. Use the chat to ask your questions. They will appear once they've been approved by the moderators, and we will uh, get our expert panel to uh, to answer them. Um, and we'll try to get it through as many as we possibly can. Um, so, of course, we're recording this session, and um, make sure that you adhere to our code of conduct. It's just kind of sort of a a nice thing to do. Make sure that we are all having a good time here, and. That brings us to our panel of experts. So we got different people from all over the Visual Studio organization from various different teams. And I think uh, we got a uh, very good chance of answering every single one of your questions. So before we dive in, let's just uh, have the uh, experts here introduce themselves briefly. Mika, why don't you start? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Nika and I'm a program manager on .NET and Visual Studio. And my main focus is to figure out ways to make .NET developers more productive in Visual Studio. Cool, and Andy here. I'm the lead program manager for the team that works on the diagnostics of debugging profiling features, as well as some of the tools used to install and get set up in Visual Studio. Hello, this is Taysir here from the Git tooling and version control team. Um, happy to, you know, answer any questions that you guys have. Hey, I'm Nick. I'm program manager on the Visual Studio C++ team. My main focus is on improving developer productivity, so happy to answer any questions. And I think with that, I swing it back over to Mads. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And uh, I want to start with a question for you, Taysir. We've had a lot of new features coming in for Git tooling. We had a lot of, uh, you know, GitHub integration and and now there's some Azure DevOps thing coming in and there's basically a lot of stuff going on when it comes to Git tooling. So where are we right now? What can we expect going forward in Visual Studio when it comes to Git tooling? Absolutely. Um, Matt, 16.10 has been a very special uh, release for us. Like we have been able to uh, release a lot of, lots of great, you know, Features that our customers have been asking us for, for example, now you know uh, we included the, the ability to sync. This is a very popular um, user ask, uh, so now you can do that in 16.10. Uh, we included uh, plenty of enhancements for our uh, status bar. You get a complete uh, repository list there, which helps you to quickly switch between uh, repositories. We have also enhanced the way you switch between branches down there. You can filter um, and switch with a single click. Um, as you mentioned, Mads, like we are, you know, still focusing on enhancing our Azure DevOps and GitHub experience. And so now we uh, include deep links to uh, pull requests. So very quickly you can get to uh, creating a new pull request or your list of uh, pull requests using the the top level Git menu for both Azure DevOps and GitHub. Uh, the Git changes window and the Git repository window has also been, uh, you know, um, enhanced uh, a lot uh, during 16.10. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, that summarizes, you know, what we have been able to do in 16.10 and uh, we, we are, you know, very uh, looking forward to what we will be uh, focusing on next. Um, when it comes to Visual Studio 22 uh, as well. All right. Yeah, so I think there's going to be a lot uh, of questions here today about Visual Studio 2022, and it's great to hear that the Git tooling is is moving forward. Um, so Nick, I know that there's a bunch of new stuff in uh, when it comes to C++. Uh, can you give us a, a quick lowdown what to expect from C++? Yeah, sure. So one big announcement that we had is that MSVC is C++ 20 feature complete as of version 16.10 GA, and we continue to add a feature to help you take advantage of the C++ 20 features. For example, we've added IntelliSense for concepts, modules, ranges, and some other things. Uh, we also have invested a lot in the CMake experience, most recently added 
port for cmakepresets.json, which basically lets you use the same exact file to build, whether you're in Visual Studio, VS Code, CI pipeline, or the command line on Windows, Linux, Mac. So that's awesome. And last thing I guess I'll say in this quick little overview is that VC package had a lot of experimental features that have now gone GA, and those include versioning, binary caching, manifests, and registries. Registries in particular are super cool because it lets you bring your custom libraries to VC package. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about any of those categories or anything else C++, leave them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. So, uh, Andy, people are asking here, when is uh, when can we try Visual Studio 2022? When can we get our hands on the preview? Soon, hopefully, very soon. Um, so we haven't announced a specific date, uh, but we're hoping for having a preview in early summer. Okay, early summer. All right. So we'll have to wait a little bit longer. Hopefully, a little not bit. Long. Yeah. Okay. Um, man, there's a lot of questions coming in here. Thank you, everybody. So I think there's a lot of people asking about when they can get their hands on Visual Studio 2022. Um, speaking of which, Mika. I know there's a lot of exciting things coming for .NET, specifically for Visual Studio 2022. Can you mention sort of the highlights? Yeah, uh, so, uh, well, we recently added .NET Hot Reload, which allows you to modify your app's managed source code while the application is running without the need to manually pause or hit a breakpoint. Uh, we also added uh, some new productivity features like remove unused references command, allowing you to remove project references and new packages that have no usages. Uh, we have tons of new IntelliSense completion options and tons more coming uh, to Visual Studio 2022. And uh, of course, for those of you that you know are light bulb fans, uh, we're going to be adding a bunch of new code fixes and refactorings. And uh, definitely just keep your eyes out on the release channel to learn more and get that full list. Wonderful. Okay, here's a question from uh, Jeremy. Uh, he's asking, um, from the Visual Studio 2022 blog post um, that it is possible to debug uh, ARM64, C++, and .NET application. Does that mean that there's an ARM64 debugger in Visual Studio or that it's coming? I don't know, Andy, if that's for you. So, uh, I, yeah, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, there's no concrete plans right now. We do have a developer community suggestion item for ARM support uh, for Visual Studio. So definitely go to develop community and search for ARM and upvote and explain a video on scenario. Uh, right now, VS 2019 uh, doesn't support running on ARM either under emulation or natively. And for VS 22, we haven't fully announced our uh, supported uh, set of OSs yet, but ARM is still something we're just thinking about. All right. So uh, yeah, so keep an eye on the on the Visual Studio blog, right, for any, any announcements there as we as we get closer to the release of Visual Studio 2022. Um, here's a question from from Chris. He asks, for Git tooling, will Visual Studio support a stash and pull workflow? So for instance, if there are local changes, automatically stash, pull, and pop instead of making it a three-step process. Uh, Tasia. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and yes, so that is something that we are going to be uh, working on in uh, Visual Studio 2022. Uh, actually, a part of that flow is is also the ability to automate uh, switching between uh, different repos. So we would like to make it easier for folks to like, you know, if if they are you know at the middle of their work, if they need to switch to a different branch or do, or switch to a different repo, we would like to you know automate that uh, and and you know allow for uh, you know automatic stashing and you know automatically opening or reloading uh, documents that they uh, used to have open so it's it's in our radar absolutely all right that's good news here's another one for you I think Andy um, um, are there any new features when it comes to Visual Studio extensibility the Visual Studio SDK like what can we expect both from people that use extensions but also for people that write extensions. Yeah, so with uh, 2022, uh, for people who are writing extensions, there's obviously the, uh, going to be a big change in terms of supporting 64-bit. There's been an extensive set of changes to the current APIs that you know extensions are built on today. And so when we release the preview, uh, there is going to be obviously SDK uh, and you get packages for that that people you know have to go forward with. And a lot of those breaking changes are really just around supporting 64-bit. So, you know, things where people have assumed that 32-bit <clears throat> uh, pointers and stuff were okay for APIs, but clearly they're not in 64-bit. So there's that set of changes. 
um, which is obviously going to be quite extensive. And then I think for people on the consuming side, the, the challenge is going to be that it's going to take time for extensions to migrate. Um, you know, as we get the first version of Visual Studio out and the first SDK into people's hands, it's just going to take time for everyone to migrate all the extensions that people use and love in Visual Studio uh, to the latest 2022 version. Um, and we're going to help work with our extension partners for that. All right. Um, Mika, here's one for you. <clears throat> this is from Alexa. He's asking, does .NET 6, the final version of .NET 6, uh, will that be available exclusively for Visual Studio 2022, or will it also be available in some update coming to Visual Studio 2019? Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, no, so uh, the .NET 6 SDK will be included in uh, Visual Studio 2022. And um, you, you know, again, you can also, um, like VS will be updated to run on .NET 6. So VS 2022 will continue to run the .NET framework and, and more things as well. And you can also use it too in uh, VS uh, 2019 as well, but by default it'll work for VS 2022. All right. Um, so we got some a bunch of questions actually about people using both Git and TFS, and they are having a hard time like moving between the two systems. And so, Taser, is there any uh, is there anything coming, or do you have any thoughts of the future of you know people that have to work with uh, various different open uh, so not open source uh, uh, version control systems? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, the the plan so far has been to um, you know continue to support Team Explorer for you know TFVC and TFS, uh, and then uh, rely on the new Git tooling to support you know uh, you know Git uh, in general. Um, so we'll we'll continue to focus on how you know to better support those who are using both. Right? Uh, we understand that you know some of the changes that we have been making might have been uh, you know uh, making uh, the you know switching between the two systems more difficult for some of uh, those users, but we'll continue to keep an eye and we'll we'll continue to invest in you know um, making that process easier. Yeah, and I've noticed Tasha over the last year or more, like people have been really really involved when it comes to like asking you and your team for specific features that are important to them. And so, how how do you handle all this feedback coming in? That's a very good question. Uh, we do different things to to handle that feedback. We listen to all of the feedback that we are getting through, uh, you know, the reporting mechanism within Visual Studio. So, like, if you there is a small icon on the top right corner of Visual Studio that users can use to report any issues or uh, or you know provide any suggestions, we keep an eye on that. Uh, we have also been actively uh, you know working with our users in uh, within suggestion tickets. Uh, we are. Still Starting to actually uh, schedule meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, uh, engaging more, and you know, um, for example, us bringing back the sync feature is a is a one example of you know us like open to all of the feedback that we are getting, right? So like if we uh, understand or if we hear that you know we are missing something or something is not working or uh, you know please be open to share all of the feedback and you know we'll we'll keep an eye on that. All right, sounds good. So Nick, here's a question from Miguel. He's asking, will there be continued support for MS Build as a project system for C++ in the foreseeable future? I assume that it's because that we talk a lot about CMake, but what about the MS Build version of C++? Yeah, we're definitely still, still investing in MS Build. For cross-platform work, we do suggest CMake, but yeah, we totally plan to keep on keeping on with MS Build. It's not going anywhere from C++? No. no. I did want to touch on, there was a question about ARM64 earlier um, and debug. I, I did want to say for C++, you can you can um, do remote debug for MS Build and CMake projects targeting uh, Windows and Linux. Um, so if you have like an ARM64 machine where you can't run VS, you can still target that. It seems like we have a lot of uh, cross-platform features coming live in for C++ and for .NET and all over. It's it's really awesome to see. Um, so Andy, this question comes up all the time. 
uh, why 64 bit now? What makes now different than in the you know in the past? Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for the great question. Um, so yeah, it, it sounds cheesy, but now has been the right time. Like for a long time in Visual Studio, uh, we've obviously been working on performance and improving reliability by doing things like taking some of the processes that you know constitute uh, Visual Studio and moving them out of the main Visual Studio process. And that's got us a lot of benefits in both uh, performance and reliability. You know, as this process is die, you know, VS doesn't die. And you know, over the same 10 year span of time, your developer hardware has increased, the availability of RAM has increased. And it's really got to the point where the best return uh, in terms of our engineering effort and investment is to move the dev end process to 64 bit. The last set of uh, issues the customers really face uh, with you know out of memory uh, exceptions and crashes in video can only really be tackled by moving the the, the final process dev to 64 bit and it's a big change especially for extensions and ourselves who have you know for two decades if not more now come to rely on a industry of being a 32 bit process and all the assumptions based around that so it's not a small change by any stretch yeah so what what can we actually expect from visual studio 2022 as a user if you know we've seen the demo i showed a little bit earlier uh yeah. scott hanselman showed in in his uh demo as well that if you open a huge solution with 1600 projects and 300,000 code files then you're going to see performance benefits and uh, you know better memory allocation stuff and whatnot but what if you don't have that what if your solution is you know consist of like 10 to 20 projects, it's like moderately sized, medium at best. Are you going to feel different in Visual Studio 2022? Yeah, so unfortunately, all things with performance, it depends. So as you kind of alluded to, the things that benefit the most uh, from us from 64-bit are places where Visual Studio ran out of memory and crashed. You know, that uh, is, happens you know, when you have large projects and solutions. And the other place that benefits is where Visual Studio is allocating a lot of memory. Um, and just subsequently the garbage collector has to run and that's what impacts performance. So solution load is a place where that's really heavy. Um, and so that's why you see those remarkable improvements from 2019. But if you're not hitting those boundaries, if you're not using, you know, even two gigs of memory, you know, it's not going to be a, a real difference for you. Uh, you'll actually notice more memory being used because of course moving to 64 bit has increased the size of binaries. Um, but you won't really notice a, you know, won't a change one way or the other. The benefit is really for people who were pushing the boundaries a bit and the scalability of what Visual Studio could do. All right, <clears throat> that's good to know. So here's a question from Mikhail. So I think this is from you, uh, for you, Mika. <clears throat> this is about Maui. Is there going to be a UI designer for Maui is the question. But I think maybe start answering that question with what is Maui? Yeah, so um, we actually have a um, we have some of the latest updates for um, Maui that we recently released in the uh, preview. Uh, so it's in Donna's preview three. We released the Win UI three support, and uh, you can also join the uh, .NET Ask the Experts session or watch uh, Scott Hunter's .NET sessions. Also, learn a lot more about Maui because it's a huge topic that they can talk about. So, all right, thank you for that. <clears throat> So there's a bunch of uh, <laughs> interest in Visual Studio 2022. I guess that's kind of expected. Um, Andy, are we ever going to run Visual Studio 2022 or some version of Visual Studio on .NET 5, 6, .NET Core? Call it whatever you want. Or are we going to stick to the .NET framework? Uh, well, some version sounds like a very long period of time. Um, so I'm sure at some point in the future. Uh, but when I... I really don't know like just moving to 64 bit is a huge step in, in terms of you know changing the way a lot of VS has been built and is being built so it doesn't seem crazy that at some point in the future we'll be moving uh, to .NET you know whatever version that is I don't think we know right now uh, right now it's just let's focus on getting 2022 out the door and making sure people have a great experience with that right all right um, so here's one, Taser. The integration with Azure DevOps, will it come back? I guess people have been used to using Team Explorer and Visual Studio for, for doing their Azure DevOps development. Um, and some of those features are, I know, already back in Visual Studio for the Git tooling, but what else to expect specifically for things that we used to do in Team Explorer? 
Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So uh, one point that we have been getting uh, feedback on is to publish uh, to Azure DevOps. So uh, that is one thing that we are going to be uh, uh, um, including in Visual Studio 2022. Uh, uh, so folks will be able to, uh, you know, uh, very quickly and easily publish to Azure DevOps, uh, similarly to how that is easy today for GitHub. Um, the other item that we have been getting lots of feedback on is, uh, you know, uh, um, a first class work item support. Um, and so in, in Visual Studio 2022, uh, we are going to be focusing on work items and issues. So for work items for Git, uh, for Azure DevOps and issues for GitHub. So uh, we are going to be including a, you know, a first class experience for those as well. Uh, those are, you know, two, two examples, I guess. All right. Um, so here's an interesting question. This has come up every now and again. Um, and I'm not sure who of you I should ask this, but when will you replace the .sln format with something more editable and maintainable? Andy, maybe that's one's for you. Is that happening? Uh, I don't know, and I don't think it is one for me. Um, yeah, I don't think we have any plans to change the .sln format in the short term, uh, but I would not be the expert here. I don't know if anyone else is. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if, if uh, that's one that comes up every now and again, and um, <clears throat> I thought I'd ask. Um, so Mika, is Visual Studio 2022 gonna include tooling for WinForms and WPF and sort of, if you have current .NET investments, are you still gonna get that sort of rich uh, UI visual tooling in 2022? Um, yes, we do, and we are, we also have um, some really cool uh, tooling as well for code analysis too that is included because uh, I see a question here in the .NET 5 uh, SDK, so we'll hopefully also have more in the .NET 6 SDK and the in Visual Studio 2022, so you can also uh, definitely check that out as well. All right. So here's one uh, question that might be one that we want uh, an answer from each one of you separately. Um, will there be major differences between Visual Studio 2019 and 2022? Can you upgrade from 2019 to 2022 easily? Nick, why don't you uh, give us your answer to this one? Sure, so, oh wait, did you say Nick or Mika? I said Nick. Okay, yeah, sure, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so for the C++ side of things, obviously, as we continue to get your feedback, we'll We'll change our roadmap and make sure that we're addressing the features that you're looking for. A couple that I'll call out for Visual Studio 2022 is that we're going to add native support for WSL2, so you won't need SSH for that. Um, we're going to continue to improve C++20 support, so I mentioned IntelliSense for concepts and modules. We'll continue to do to add more tooling around that, um, especially helping you modernize your code with things like code analysis and linters. We continue to add rules for those. Um, someone in the comments was asking something about the serif format. Um, code analysis actually uses um, serif 2.1. Code analysis supports serif 2.1 now, so um, I don't know if that addresses your question, but I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, and then as far as the upgrade story, uh, Visual Studio 2020, 2022 is um, binary compatible with, with everything from Visual Studio 2015 to 2019. So. Uh, you should still be able to upgrade just as easily as you have from the last version. So let's talk about that binary compatibility. That basically means that whatever version you're on currently of Visual Studio 2015, 2017, 2019, you can continue working on the same source code, your same repo using 2022, and it's all backwards compatible. Uh, it's binary compatible. That means the compiler, the runtime, all that stuff. Right. So the tool set is going to be binary compatible. Uh, there is a lot of talk about um binary incompatibility breaking the abi that is something that we are aware of we're we're continuing to evolve our understanding of the c++ language as it evolves we know we know an abi break will be inevitable but we also know that not breaking the abi is allowing really smooth transitions so when that time comes that we do break it we'll make sure that we are over communicating it and do everything we can to smoothen that transition yep all right so um, let's see here. That was a question. Where did it go? So remote debugging, Andy. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had some capabilities in the past of like attaching to Azure with snapshot debugging and 
and there's a lot of capabilities. Do we have more in terms of remote debugging scenarios, maybe even cross-plat remote as well um, in for 2022 or 2019 for that matter? Uh, so yes, like uh, for in general, remote debugging like has worked cross-platform targeting like Docker containers and SSH, so literally any sort of host, as well as you mentioned the Azure App Services uh, and uh, VMs and things like that. So those things will continue, and we're just really expanding the capabilities. Um, like Visual Studio kind of has two debuggers: the debugger using Ents Window and the cross-platform debugger. And we've been improving the capabilities in uh, the cross-platform one to be more aligned to the Windows ones. Uh, so allowing things like that search feature that we had uh, shipped for the Windows scenarios that people use locally and remotely when targeting Windows. Uh, so really, the thing we've been working on in both 2019 and 2022 is improving the capabilities so they're more equal. So you can target Linux just the same experience as you would Windows, including in the future, we're looking at how you do profiling and other things like that. So you can get targeting. It doesn't matter where the runtime runs or if it's C++ or managed, you'll be able to get the same capabilities as you would today locally. Okay. If you can get if you can get a tunnel, like so if you get an SSH connection app, you're sorted. Uh, and obviously if you can't, that's a bit of a challenge. Well, but that's kind of exciting stuff. So so we're kind of opening up for a lot of more remote uh, debugging here. What about remote development? There we've had some questions about uh, GitHub code spaces, uh, Andy. Um, Visual Studio's ability to work and connect to GitHub code spaces. Where where are we with that? What is the what is the status? Uh, so the status of uh, Visual Studio for code, uh, code space, sorry, Visual Studio code spaces for GitHub specifically. Yes, that was the question. Yeah, so I think as we announced uh, a while back on the blog, we decided to wind down um, that preview and we learned a lot from it. Um, but right now the focus is really on VS Code scenarios uh, for that. So the Visual Studio uh, is on hold and uh, I think it's being uh, you know, notified as being deprecated at the moment. Yep. Okay. Uh, here's one from Eric. Um, is there a way to create project templates or solution templates? And I know, Mika, that uh, with .NET template engine, that there is an effort to standardize or come up with sort of a new way, an easy way to create templates. Where are we with, the, with that? What's the situation there? So for uh, templates, uh, so you can also look at our um, repo for that, and we're lo looking at things to include for like .NET new and like the CLI and everything. So uh, you can definitely check that out on GitHub as well um, and see exactly what we're working on uh, for, for .NET projects there. All right, thank you. So uh, Tasia, let me ask you a question about Visual Studio 2022. Like, what is in your mind the coolest thing that you're looking forward to? Yeah, the that's a great question, Matt. Thanks. Uh, uh, I guess the the coolest thing I'm looking forward to is multi-repo support. That is something that you know lots of our users have been asking for for a long time, and we haven't really been able to get to uh, until now, right? And so now with all of the you know uh, the base done for the new get tooling, um, I think we are in we are ready to start to uh, invest in that, right? So uh, as we get into Visual Studio 2022, uh, you know expect that we'll be you know um, working on that gradually. Uh, it's a it's a huge uh, feature, uh, so we'll you know be you know gradually tackling that. But that is that is the biggest thing that I'm very excited about. Nice. Um, yeah, that is good stuff. We have a question coming in here from uh, Chris. Nick, this is for you. Any more support in the VZPKG roadmap for the private or the corporate scenario? For example, we want the team to use an approved version of a library as opposed to pulling it from the open internet, right? So some sort of security or safety around the libraries you use there. Any, anything coming up? Um, so I know they are looking a lot into security right now. And then I did mention with registries that you're able to bring your own private libraries uh, to VC package. I'm not sure if that's that answers exactly the scenario you're looking for. Um, I can maybe get back to you about security in a second. I can ping someone and then maybe we can, we can come back with an answer. I'll type it in the chat. All right. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, so Max has a question here. Is it planned? to support Git multi-repo solutions in Visual Studio? I think, Tasia, you just answered it. Yes, that is coming. 
multi repo yeah so multi um i guess the question is slightly different right um and this is a part of what we are investigating right now like is is are we going to be supporting you know multi multiple repos within a single folder for example or is it like mul like solutions that spans across different repos it is you know it is a question that we are trying to answer um but it is you know within what we are trying to investigate i guess so I don't have the final answer uh, for that question. All right. Um, um, and so here's one. So we're we're actually at 30 minutes now. So everyone watching this live, if you want to jump over and uh, follow some of your other content that you want to see, please go ahead and do that. We're going to hang out for a few other minutes just to make sure that we answer all your questions. So if you got any, please keep them coming and we will try to answer them all. So Andy. Jeff is asking if there's going to be support for profiling tools such as the memory profiler uh, with Docker debugging. Uh, yeah, so that is something uh, we're looking at right now. Um, you can profile on the uh, Linux box uh, anywhere with like a command line tool, uh, and then you can collect that trace and bring it back to Visual Studio. So there's not a, like a, a live and interactive experience. And that is a gap we're looking to fill in the future uh, and is on the roadmap, I think. But that so. So that means, uh, you know, Docker debugging is on the roadmap for the future. It's coming. Uh... Docker debugging is there right now. Um, the thing that's not there is the diagnostic tools and profiling. Um, so in general, whenever we support a new platform, we focus on debugging first and then uh, profiling uh, from command line collection. Since most customers, you know, in especially in Linux scenarios, they talk about deployed servers. So it's not like they're running Visual Studio and they can talk to the box. So it's more important to have a command line tool you can run and collect trace and then analyze that back in a tool like Visual Studio or Perfume or WPA or whatever the preferred tool is. All right. So Mika, we got uh, this question uh, from various different people. It's about source generators in C Sharp. Uh, any improvements in the tooling in Visual Studio uh, in the future? Yeah, so we recently added debugger support, so you can now debug a source generated file. And uh, we also have uh, navigation options, so you can find all references within a source generated file. You can also, um, we added a source generator uh, node within Solution Explorer underneath the, the dependencies analyzers nodes. So you can actually uh, navigate and view the source generated files as well. Um, and, you know, all um, source generators is open source, so you can definitely uh, check out the source generator project to see what's coming um, up at ak.ms forward slash Roslyn. So you can check it out there. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds really good. That sounds like it's getting the full first class citizen treatment inside Visual Studio. We're all in on, on source generators, it sounds like. Um, so we got another extension question, uh, Andy, for you probably. Um, can I trust all extensions on the marketplace? Um, that's a good question, I think. Like, what's your answer? Um, yeah, so my personal answer would be that the marketplace is obviously, you know, uh, anyone can submit extensions. They are, they're not, as we say, they are, we don't have a strict trust policy. It's really like caveat emptor. You as a developer, it's like social trust. Um, you have to decide if you trust the extension of the company behind that extension. Uh, we don't make any promises or guarantees about what the extension can and can't do. Um, so, you know, it's, it is feasible for an extension to do something you don't want it to do. Um, and so it's really up to you as the person installing the extension to make the trust decision of the company or the author publishing it. So like if it's published by Microsoft, you know, that is that the publisher can be trusted um, or you can decide to trust the publisher in case you don't trust us. Uh, but beyond that, and you know, if it's obviously an open source project, maybe that gives you some confidence, but it is really up to you as the installer person in choosing to install that extension to trust it or not trust it. Yeah. All right. And so Nick, here's one uh, from Chris. Uh, what does the roadmap look like for tooling around developing a CMake project, as in the actual writing of the .CMake files, not just building a project generated from CMake? Yeah, so we've done work recently to add IntelliSense support for a lot of the editing of the actual CMake files themselves, which is awesome. Uh, we've got some blog posts about it. In general, I highly recommend going to our Visual Studio C++ blog, we've, and you can just type CMake there, and it'll spit out everything we've ever released about it. 
Um, but yeah, we have added that IntelliSense support, which makes it much easier to write. Uh, and then I mentioned the CMake presets.json file support that we recently added. So that's also worth checking out. And we'll continue to add more and improve that experience as you give us feedback for sure. All right. Well, thank you. Well, I think we're at the uh, at the end of our questions here for today. And so thank you everybody in the audience for uh, for asking your questions. And uh, you know, continue doing that. Reach out on Twitter, on our blogs. Keep following us, and uh, we are ready to answer your question and to engage. So, um, so please keep the questions and the feedback coming. Um, it sounds like from all your answers here today that we're going to have a great release with Visual Studio 2022. It's going to be jam packed with fantastic things, whether it's .NET, C++, the Visual Studio Core itself, uh, Git tooling, and whatnot. So, uh, I'm super excited. And I hope everyone watching is uh, is as well. I think uh, we have a lot to look forward to here. So um, thank you, everyone on the uh, panels, all the experts. Um, it was uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, I hope uh, that we can do this again soon. This was fun. All right. So have a great rest of your build conference, and um, take care.